Today is the third Sunday after Easter here in Chicago. The epistle is taken from St. Peter, his first epistle, chapter 2. Brought, beloved, I exhort you as strangers and pilgrims to abstain from carnal desires which war against the soul. Behave yourselves honorably among the pagans, that whereas they slander you as evildoers, they may, through observing you by reason of your good works, glorify God in the day of visitation. Be subject, therefore, to every human creature for God's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as sent through him for vengeance on evildoers and for the praise of the good. For such is the will of God that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Live as free men, yet not using your freedom as a cloak for malice, but as servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters in all fear, not only to the good and moderate, but also to the severe. This is indeed a grace in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. John, chapter 16. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, A little while, and you, shall not, and you shall see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. Some of his disciples therefore said to one another, What is this that he saith to us? A little while, and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, and you shall see me. And I go to the Father. They kept saying, therefore, What is this little while of which he speaks? We do not know what he is saying. But Jesus knew that they wished to ask him, and he said to them, You inquire this, about this among yourselves, because I said a little while, and you shall not see me, and again a little while, and you shall see me. Amen, amen, I say to you that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman about to give birth has sorrow because her hour has come, but when she has brought forth the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for her joy that a man is born into the world. And you therefore have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no one shall take from you. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. By way of announcement, Tomorrow when I land in Boston, I will pray an exorcism over the whole city. You probably know that Boston just held these three days the Satanic Convention, calling on devils, doing Satanic incantations, rituals, sacrifices, who knows what else, and all this going on in Boston. There, there was a good show of Catholics who were there praying the rosary. If I wasn't on the mass circuit, I would have certainly been there. But uh, where was the, the Archbishop of Boston? Crickets chirping. <laughs> Where's all the clergy when it comes to the real battle? And this is the real punishment on all of us, is the cowardice and the betrayal and the apostasy of the clergy. Starting from the very top, Pope Francis on down. And you might say, well, we got good traditional bishops. We do. Show me. Show me any of them that are preaching the way Archbishop Lefebvre preached. Show me any of them that are attacking the scandals of these modernist popes. Show me any of them. And all the sons of Archbishop Lefebvre, they all know better. They all know better. And now they have treat Archbishop Lefebvre just like... Uh, well, they forgot about him. Remember, they were talking about 80s-ism. This is not the 88-ism. This is not 1988. This is now 2012. Remember, they were saying that. So anyway, uh, that's part of the punishment God has allowed on the whole world. Bad politicians, effeminate leaders, and uh, an apostate clergy. Nevertheless, we have to pray for them all. And... And we must battle on. So, and then also uh, this, this June, 
that the last week of June will be the Women's Ignatian Retreat in Kansas. Father Ruiz will be preaching it with me. And then uh, the first week of July will be the Men's Ignatian Retreat. Pray that it goes well. Pray that Father can get into the country and pray they lift this ridiculous requirement to get into the country to have the whiskey into the arm. Pray they lift that finally for all foreigners coming in. And then also, any of you who are interested, there will be the Young Adults Gathering in Montana in July, the weekend of July 16th. So be prepared to hike, bring boots, and the men must bring sleeping bags because they'll be camping outside on a ranch. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. St. Augustine says, What does this mean that our Lord is saying? A little while and you shall not see me, and again a little while and you shall see me. A little while you shall not see me. That is, 40 days after our Lord was with the apostles, after his resurrection, he was physically among them, and he told them at first, I'm not a ghost, because he came through the wall in the, in the cenacle, where the Jews were dead scared because they thought the Jews would hunt them down and crucify them all next. So they weren't up to breaking up, breaking open the rock and kidnapping the body. They were not up to that. And if they tried, the Roman soldiers were there and they would have killed them on the spot. So the apostles being scared, they were in the cenacle with, around the Virgin Mary. And she tried to tell them, don't you remember our Lord's words? He said he would rise on the third day. Yeah, but he's, he's dead. We, we heard, we could hear the shouts of the crowd when he was being scourged at the pillar. There's no way a man can rise from the dead after that. And his blood was all spilled all over, all the way to Cal Mount Calvary. A whole trail of blood. How can he rise from that? So, our Lord, on Easter morning, he, his soul came up from limbo. His soul was reunited to his body. Remember, his body was cold and stiff and totally mangled. His heart was, the, the transfixion of his heart was open. He had a gaping wound in his heart, and his wounds were all infected. And our Lord came, his soul came into the body and brought life. And his heart began to pump. Blood began to be made miraculously. All the wounds, there were 630 deep wounds of Christ that show up on the Shroud of Turin. 72 wounds just on the head. And our Lord revealed to St. Bridget that there were well over 4,000 cuts, bruises, and wounds all over him. For over 4,000. And we... We, uh, you know, get all out of sorts if we just cut our finger. So our dear Lord, he, he left his image in the Shroud of Turin, his body fully recovered, fully um, filled with the divine person, miraculously rose from the dead to rise and to be glorious forever and ever and never to die again. So our Lord, he kept the five wounds in his body. And as his body rose, the scientists who study the shroud, they, they recently actually concluded that there, there had to be a bright, a bright light with the voltage that would keep a city, a big city, with electricity for a number of years. That's the power of light that emanated from Christ's body when he rose from the dead. And that image of the shroud was burnt in and what puzzles the scientists is that that cloth should have just been reduced to ashes but it wasn't and our lord passed through the cloth and then he passed through the rock with a light the, the bright light that emanated from him he just walked through the rock and it was the angel who came down and picked up the rock like a huge bowling ball picked it up slammed it on the ground and sat on it and at this point, the soldiers were all in terror because lightning and, and, and a bright 
light emitted from the angel, which some of the fathers say was St. Saint Gabriel the Archangel. And then our Lord went first to visit his mother, risen from the dead. And she kissed his wounds, and he held her and picked her up, because she was like a wilted lily, just, uh, just on the ground and flattened from the hurricane of the Passion. The sorrows of Our Lady were as deep as the ocean. O, o daughter of Jerusalem, who can console you? All you that pass by the way, look and see if there is any sorrow like unto my sorrow. For deep as the sea is your distress, who can console you? That's Our Lady's tremendous sorrows. And those who honor her sorrows, you'll be loved by our Lord. And the promise is you will die a holy death. So love the Immaculate Heart of Mary, love her sorrows. And then on Easter Sunday, later in the day, the apostles are, the ten of them are gathered in the cenacle. St. Thomas, he was out maybe getting food or shopping. And Judas hanged himself and his guts burst open. And his soul most likely went straight to hell. And so it was just ten apostles there. And they are there, remember, they're scared, they're depressed, they've lost the faith, they don't know what they're going to do, everything's rushing through their head, and they're, they're sad. And then our Lord, they see this bright light come right through the wall, there's no knocking at the door, there's no ringing the doorbell, our Lord just walks right through the wall. And they stand up in awe. And they look at each other, and they don't know what to think. Is it a ghost? And our Lord, he says to them, Pax Vobis, peace be to you. He says it three times. Peace be to you. And he says, come, come and touch my wounds. I'm not a ghost. Give me some of the food you're eating, the fish and the honeycomb. And our Lord ate it. And they touched his hands and touched his feet and fell at his feet, bathing them in their tears of repentance. Imagine the repentance of these first bishops of the Catholic Church and our first Pope, who wept bitterly because they really betrayed our Lord. They all ran from him, and they all lost the faith. Every one of them lost the faith. Very similar to the times we're in right now. We have, we have so many five bad Popes who are a scandal, who are really uh, bringing what our Lord foretold, the apostasy of Rome, the loss of the faith in Rome. And then all the bishops, the bishops who, lost, who have lost the faith. That's why Archbishop Lefebvre warned, don't put yourselves under these modernist bishops. That's the greatest danger in these times, because they are there to crush the faith. Even if, even if they allow the Latin Mass here or there, it's not because they love tradition. It's because, you know, traditional parishes bring in a big income because a lot of people go there. They know that. But with Pope Francis trying to crush the Latin Mass, we're giving it the final blow. Many bishops are following suit. And, and Supic, of course, you're poor. This poor archbishop, or what is he, cardinal now? The poor creature, that poor creature... He's, uh, he's got a huge hell waiting for him if he doesn't turn around, pray for his soul. Remember, he banned two years ago the St. Michael prayer to be said publicly. St. Michael's the one to call on an exorcism. And when the priest does an exorcism, St. Michael's the first name mentioned. O oh, most glorious prince of the angels, St. Michael the archangel. And here he ex he's, the, he's <laughs> it's forbidden to say his prayer in these novice auto churches. So it's obvious they've opened the door to, to hell. And Kopor Supic and Lightfoot and whoever else is now your poor governor, these poor criminals. But it's a punishment from God when allow, God allows these things. And the blame goes on the bishops and the popes. It always does. I'm a clergy, and I know it's the, all good comes from the clergy when the priests are good and the bishops are good. When the Pope is good, it shakes the whole world. It elevates society and culture. It's beautiful, the effect of the Catholic priesthood.
which is the, the effect of the Sacred Heart on the whole world, because the priest is the Sacred Heart of Jesus in another Christ, another Sacred Heart. He's supposed to be. But when the clergy are bad, it is a punishment on the world and on a diocese. And on and when the Pope is bad, it's it's a very big punishment. So, so our Lord came to the our first Pope and these first bishops. And he the scripture says he upbraided them. He he reproved them for their loss of faith. Why did you lose the faith when I told you I would rise from the dead on the third day? But come and touch my wounds. Put your hand in my side. I'm not a ghost. And they recovered the faith. And it took a long time for all this to register. It took a long time. Would we be any different? And our Lord then, he tells them, uh, in the la this was actually at the Last Supper, a little while and you shall not see me. That is when our Lord after 40 days will ascend into heaven. A little while you're not going to see me because I'm going to ascend. And they watched our Lord physically ascend into heaven. They watched him rise like a, a huge air balloon that just goes up and up. They watched him. And again a little while and you shall see me. That little while is between the ascension and the second coming. And in the case of the apostles, at their death. When they were martyred for the faith, Every one of them shed blood for Christ. They were all martyred in some way. And they went straight to heaven and they see the face of Christ now. And that little while will be also at the second coming when Christ comes to judge the living and the dead. So our Lord, he rebuilt the faith of these apostles. But the Blessed Mother, the Virgin Mary, she never lost the faith. She never even doubted once. But it doesn't mean... She, she doesn't, didn't suffer. Listen to the letter of Pontius Pilate to Tiberius Caesar. In verse 14 of St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, it says, And if the governor shall hear of this, we will persuade him and secure you. Verse 13 was saying, Say you, his disciples came by night and stole his body away when we were asleep. So what's going on here is the, the soldiers witnessed the light coming out of the tomb. They saw the angel pick up the rock and throw it down and sit on it. And St. Cyril and other saints tell us that the angel looked so threatening with a sword of fire. And he, he looked at the soldiers, and some say there were up to a hundred Roman guards there. And he looked at them as if to say, quoting St. Cyril, Come and attack me. Go ahead and try. Because if you do, I will crush you like fleas. <laughs> so that's why the scripture says they were terrified, paralyzed with fear. And some of the fathers, gathered by Father Cornelius Alapide, says that some of these soldiers, they were just frozen to the ground. Others got up and hid behind the hedges in the bushes to watch what's going on. And then they saw the women come, and the angels talked to the women. They saw the angel talk to St. Mary Magdalene. And St. Mary Magdalene runs back to tell the apostles that the tomb is empty. And the angel said, why are you looking for the dead among the living? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? And they run, and then the soldiers still are watching. They see St. James and St. Excuse me, St. Peter and St. John run to the tomb. And then they recover their senses. They get up and start inspecting the tomb themselves, the Roman soldiers. And they just saw it's empty. And remember, the, there was the guards, there was the stone, there was the chains that were bolted over the stone by order of the Sanhedrin. And the seal of the Sanhedrin on the chains. So there's no way the apostles, who were dead scared, would come and make noise and steal the body. Because they were, they just, they'd be too scared. And the soldiers were there awake on duty. At least a, a handful of them would always be awake. So this is what 
happened was these soldiers became the first witnesses of our Lord's resurrection. And that's when they ran to the Jews and said, we saw him rise and we saw angels and we saw the women talking with angels and, and they were telling, the angels were telling the women, he is risen, he's not here. And we saw the tomb, we inspected it, we can't explain it. But this crucified man is alive and he's, the tomb is empty and no one came to take the body. So this is when the Jews said, verse 13, Say you, his disciples came by night and stole him away when we were asleep. And St. Augustine makes fun of this, saying, Sleeping witnesses? Sleeping witnesses? If the Roman guards were caught sleeping, it meant death for them if they were sleeping on duty. And then verse 14, And if the governor shall hear of this, that's Pontius Pilate, we will persuade him and secure you. In other words, if Pontius Pilate hears about this, that he's risen from the dead, uh, don't worry, we'll, we'll talk him out of it, and we'll take care of you. Here's money. Here's a lot of money. And Saint, I think it's Saint uh, Eutemius and Saint Jerome say that the money was taken from the temple, which was for the worship of God. So they made a sacrilege. So the soldiers did finally come to Pontius Pilate because he wanted to know what's going on. And here's what happened. That is, we will persuade Pilate, the Jews told them, the soldiers, that your sleep and negligence in guarding the body of Christ was a light matter deserving forgiveness and that no harm can happen from it, for he knows that this business does not concern himself but us. And so he, to please us, and against his own conscience, he condemned Jesus to be crucified. For if he was so yielding when he unjustly condemned Jesus, at our insistence, the Jews are talking here, he will be much more yielding in absolving you at our request. So don't worry, soldiers. We'll give you a lot of money. Just don't talk about it. And we'll handle Pontius Pilate. He's in our back pocket anyway. But the soldiers secretly disclosed the deception and the whole matter to Pontius Pilate and confirmed the truth of Christ's resurrection. And Pilate wrote the account to Tiberius Caesar in Rome, who forthwith was desirous, after hearing about Christ rising from the dead, Tiberius Caesar wanted to enroll Christ among the gods of Rome. <laughs> so he wanted to build a statue of Christ as one of the new gods of Rome. So Hegesippus relates from the Acts of Pilate himself, quote, this is, this is Pontius Pilate writing, The leaders of the Jews falsely asserted to me that, that Jesus was a sorcerer and had broken their law, and I believed that it was so and delivered him to be scourged according to their will. But they crucified him and set a watch at the sepulchre, but he, he rose again on the third day while my soldiers were keeping watch. But the wickedness of the Jews was inflamed to such a pitch that they gave money to the soldiers and said, Say ye that his disciples stole away his body. But when they had received the money, they were not able to be silent about what had been done. For they testified that they had seen him rise and that they had received money from the Jews. I have therefore made a statement of these things, that no one may falsely allege otherwise, and suppose that that credit ought to be given to the falsehood of the Jews. So that's a heavy authority from Hegesippus. Other authors also teach that Pontius Pilate reported these things to Tiberius Caesar. Tertullian in the 3rd century, he lived in the 200s, Tertullian, in his book, Apologia, chapter 5, speaks about it. And also Eusebius, the great Jewish historian. Uh, and Josephus as well. Listen to Eusebius. He said, after Pilate reported to Tiberius about the teachings of the Christians, Tiberius brought it before the Senate in Rome so that it might be counted among the other sacred doctrines. But when it pleased the council of patricians to eliminate Christians from the city, Tiberius issued an edict threatening with death those who had accused the Christians. 
And also another authority, Orosius is his name, in Book 7, Chapter 4, says, Pilate reported the passion and resurrection of Christ to the Emperor Tiberius, and also the mighty deeds that were subsequently performed openly by him, or were being done by his disciples in his name, as well as the fact that increasing numbers of people were believing in God with an eager faith. Verse 15 of St. Matthew, chapter 28. So they, take, so they, the soldiers, taking the money, did as they were taught. And this word was spread abroad among the Jews even unto this day. That is, among the common people and those of little sense. For the wiser men easily saw through the deceit of the Jews and found out the whole manner, matter in secret from the soldiers. So just Josephus will also write about this in uh, Book 18, Chapter 4 of the History of Antiquities, saying about Christ doing miracles, rising from the dead. And so what happened to those soldiers? What happened to those Roman soldiers? Many of them came to the apostles, met the Virgin Mary, came to St. Peter, and many of them after Pentecost, became Catholic. They were baptized. We don't know what happened to Malchus. Remember the one that got his ear chopped off? There's no word what happened to him, and he's not venerated as a saint. Maybe he, who knows, but Joseph, uh, Father Cornelius Alapide, he favors the opinion that, Lon, that Malchus later also converted. But we do know one outstanding soldier and that was St. Longinus. And St. Longinus, he witnessed the whole passion of our Lord. And look at the passion from the eyes of Longinus. They were used to handling criminals and handling crucifixion. It was normal routine for capital punishment. But they never saw a man like this. They never saw a man beaten like this and so hated and Venerable Anne Catherine Emmerich says the whole city had almost hell, almost all of hell was emptied, and all the devils were in Jerusalem on Good Friday, possessing some of the soldiers, possessing the Jews, and stirring the people up to hatred against Christ. So Longinus saw our Lord, and he was in charge of the whole thing. To Pontius Pilate gave the word, beat him and beat him good. So the people, when they see him all beaten and mangled, they'll have pity on him and set him free. Of course, that didn't happen. So our Lord was beaten at the scourging so horribly. And on the front and on the back and suspended on the rope. And it was so brutal that the scripture says, they have pierced my hands and my feet. They have numbered all my bones. They could count the ribs of our Lord at the, after the scourging. You could count the ribs in his side that was so torn off. And then when they cut the ropes, he just dropped in the splashing in his own puddle of blood. So Longinus, you know, he would have known this man's not going to last long. And then the soldiers have fun. They crown him with thorns and they pound the thorns deep in his skull and head wounds bleed profusely. So our Lord had constantly, uh, constantly his eyes were filling with blood. Our, our Virgin Mother told St. Bridget that our Lord, ever since the crowning of thorns, he had to squeeze his eyes to squeeze out the blood just to see. And all the blood caked in his beard and in his mouth. And you know the taste of blood. It's not too pleasant. And especially with, if your mouth, our Lord had cotton mouth. By, by, with blood loss, you get nauseous, you get shivering, you get cold sweat. That's the state our Lord was in. And after so much blood loss, a normal man will die. After 40% of blood loss, a normal adult male will drop dead. And so Longinus, he couldn't believe that Christ was able to actually pick up the cross and not only pick it up, but embrace the cross and kiss it as the trophy with which he's going to carry and conquer Satan, death, and sin. And uh, one medical doctor told me, 
a normal man, the best NFL, NHL player, the best athlete, best condition, strongest, maybe, maybe would have survived the scourging, but probably would have died. But if he didn't die at the scourging and the crowning of thorns, he would have dropped dead at the gates of Jerusalem. He would never have made it up to Calvary. Never. But our Lord, this is what Longinus is watching. He sees the hatred of the Jews. They're, they're throwing rotten cabbage, eggs, and rotten carrots at him, tomatoes. And they're kicking him. Whenever our Lord falls, they see him surround our Lord like a pack of wild dogs and kick him in his ribs. They kicked him so violently that his kidneys stopped working. That's why the image on the shroud is so clear, because the uric acid was no longer being filtered through the kidneys, and it was just coming out his pores. And that's why the image was so clear on the shroud, because of that acid. And then our Lord, he carries the cross, and he's going all the way, and he falls and gets back up. And then he's hanging on the cross, they nail him to the cross, and he's hanging there for three long hours. And Longinus, he's never seen a man last this long. He can't believe what he sees. And then he can't believe what he sees, because at 12 noon, when they put him up on the cross, and they finally settle him in, the darkness, the eclipse of the sun for three hours. And with the eclipse of the sun, you get the cool air and the winds picking up. And a storm, and the huge, at three o'clock when Christ died, the huge earthquake, which some of the fathers and historians at that time record and say it shook the whole earth. The mystics say it shook the entire earth. And even the mountains in Italy, even the Rocky Mountains were affected. Because the whole earth revolted that man could kill our God. And we were there by our sins too. And so our Lord, uh, when he died, Longinus is watching all this. And our Lord, and then what really blows his mind is our Lord is hanging on the cross in a suffocating position for three hours. You can't utter a word, but he gave seven words, the seven last words. And the seventh word was Christ pulled down on the nails, pushed down on the nails on his feet. And with the roar of a lion, St. John was there to witness it. And he says, mania voce, voce mania, a loud voice. The lion of the tribe of Judah roaring on the cross with a loud voice of thunder. Longinus and the soldiers, they just take a double look. They can't believe it. And our Lord shouts, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Bows his head and dies. And just then the earthquake hits. <laughs> and to make sure he's dead, Longinus takes the sword and transfixes his heart right up from the right side into the heart, piercing right into the heart. And according to an ancient tradition with a small t, St. Longinus had some eye troubles in one of his eye. He was going blind. And when he struck the heart of Jesus, the, the water and blood splashed over his face. And he was miraculously cured. And after witnessing all this, after witnessing the Virgin Mary, the sweetness and the strength of this valiant woman at the foot of the cross, he's never seen anything like this before. And the forgiveness and the tenderness and the love of that mother. Here's what happened to St. Longinus. St. Longinus, according to this account, was the centurion who, standing at by Pilate's direction with other soldiers beside the cross of our Lord, pierced his side with a lance. And seeing the portents which followed, the darkening of the sun and the earthquake, he believed in Christ. He's the one that shouted, he shouted, truly this had to be the Son of God. But what influenced him most, as some relate, was that though his sight was failing him, either through age or infirmity, the blood of our Savior splashing on his eyes, touched his eyes, and straightway he saw clearly. 2020 vision. 
For this reason he gave up being a soldier afterwards, and after being instructed by the apostles and baptized by them, he led a monastic life in, in Caesarea of Cappadocia, which is modern-day Turkey. By his words and example, winning many souls to Christ. Imagine listening to Longinus speak about what he saw and what he learned from the apostles and meeting the Blessed Virgin Mary. Can you imagine? And he won many souls. He converted many people where he lived. Having been brought to trial and refusing to offer sacrifice to the gods, the governor of, of Caesarea ordered all his teeth to be knocked out and his tongue cut out. Nevertheless, St. Longinus did not in consequence lose his power of speech. He could miraculously speak. And picking up an axe, he walked up to the idols, the big huge statues that they brought him before to burn incense, he refused to burn incense, and he picked up an axe, and <laughs> went, he went after the idols and broke them up to pieces, and cried aloud, Now we shall see whether they are gods. But a pack of demons issued out from the statues of the idols, and entered into the governor and his attendants. Then, gibbering and howling and screaming, they fell down at St. Longinus's feet. Thereupon, St. Longinus said to them, Why take you up your abode in idols? Why do you live in idols? Who answered, Where the name of Christ is not heard, and the sign of the cross is not made, there is our dwelling place. So you see the importance of the sign of the cross. The devils can't take it. Meanwhile, the governor continued to rave and act and scream, and he was now blind. So St. Longinus said to the governor, Know that you can only be cured when you have put me to death. But as soon as I shall have surrendered my life by, the, by your act, I will pray for you, and I will obtain for you health both of body and soul. Straight away then, the governor ordered St. Longinus' head to be cut off. And immediately this was done, he threw, the governor threw himself down beside the body of St. Longinus and with tears manifested his repentance. But in the same moment, he recovered his sanity along with his sight, and he ended his life in the doing of all good works. So that's what happened to Longinus, and he's a saint in heaven. And if you walk into St. Peter's Basilica, there's a big, huge statue of St. Longinus with uh, the cross behind him. So those soldiers, uh, he wasn't the only one that converted. Many of them did and became Catholic. So let's pray to the Virgin Mary. Let's pray to St. Thomas, the doubter who our Lord came back for him a week after Easter and told him, Thomas, don't be unbelieving, but believe. And that's what Mother Church puts in the Mass when you receive communion. The communion antiphon for Low Sunday last week, or two weeks ago, was, put your hand in my side and touch my wounds. Do not be faithless, but believing. So when you receive communion today, you are touching the wounds of Christ. You are touching the sacred heart, but it's not dead. It's the living heart. It's the living hands. It's the living feet. It's the living sacred face. It is his glorified body in heaven that you receive. It is the pledge of your future glory to come. Who eats my flesh and drinks my blood shall not taste death forever. This is the power of the Holy Eucharist. This is the power of the Mass. So no wonder the devil is working so hard to destroy this Mass, to destroy Catholic tradition. But he won't succeed. And this is where, from the basements, from the catacombs, from the barns, many priests said Mass down the centuries during many persecutions. And the Catholic faith always came out shining and powerful and brilliant because of Christ. And Our Lady foretold the age of her Immaculate Heart. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. So don't be discouraged. Keep fighting. Keep fighting with the weapons of heaven. The five first Saturdays of reparation is very big in God's eyes. Very important to do those. 
the daily rosary, the scapular of Our Lady, and to be strong in the faith in this age of, of the Good Friday of the Church. And it might get worse. It might get much worse. Normally, these kind of events, God allows that it comes to blood. And another wave of martyrs, which will do call down God's mercy and convert many souls. So let's be strong. Let's beg the Virgin Mary to be faithful like she was at the foot of the cross and never to waver, never to, to compromise on the faith either. And that's what's being, been offered by modernist Rome to Bishop Follet and the new SSPX and all the bishops of Bishop, of Bishop Lefebvre is make a deal, get recognized, get canonical solution, and put the faith on the back burner, put the faith on the back seat. And Archbishop Lefebvre warned, never do this. Never put the faith second and get a approval first. But that's, what the, that's what's happened. And this is why this crisis is so serious in Catholic tradition. So we don't compromise, and we never lay down our weapons either. So let's beg the Mother of God for that grace of final perseverance. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us to O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us to O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us to And for those who do not have recourse to Thee, especially all Communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church, Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.